Thank you, Frank. Good evening. Welcome to the Foxborough Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, April 28th. I'll read the agenda. The chair reserves the right to call items on the agenda out of order. The times that are listed for items are approximate times and items may be reached earlier or later than the posted times. The listing of items is those reasonably, reasonably anticipated by the chair, which may be discussed at the meeting at least 48 hours prior to the meeting. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed and other items not listed may also be brought up for, the discuss for discussion to the extent permitted by law. At 7 p.m. we have citizens input Topics not reasonably anticipated by the chair, 48 hours in advance of the meeting. 705, Selectman's Update. 710, we have a presentation on the Southeastern Regional School uh, Fiscal Year 16 budget. At 715, we have uh, guest speaker Susan Pinacho from CRC Habitopco to discuss the growing opiate addiction problem. 735, we have Chief O'Leary for a discussion on the commercial parking lot regulations. 750, Bill Keegan will uh, provide us with a discussion for on the public records request. At 8, the board will discuss uh, the possible vote on an omnibus motion to support water and sewer commission actions. 810, uh, the board will discuss the town manager evaluation for Bill. And at 820, Bill will provide us with a town manager update. Jim, would you lead us some touch, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So our, our first item is citizens' input. Is there anyone in the audience? Okay, seeing none. Um, I'll provide a brief selectman's update. I'd like to start off by acknowledging with sadness the passing of Danny Nickerson and extending um, the board's sympathies to the Nickerson Jameson family. Uh, Danny was six years old and he uh, will be remembered, I'm sure, by many, but also with the fact that he brought together the community and many people all over the world last year who helped him celebrate his birthday. So um, I'd like us to take a moment of silence in his memory. Thank you. Okay. Um, I wanted to mention uh, a really great announcement last night that the senior class of 2015 announced that they were uh, creating a class gift, a memorial garden for Sam Burns. And um, it was presented by um, Kayla Seppi and also by Brian DeVellis to the uh, school committee. So I think that's you know a wonderful tribute to Sam and uh, I'm very proud, I'm sure we're all very proud of the presentation and also the senior class. Thank you very much. They've, uh, just so that everybody knows, they've created a GoFundMe site and are working to raise $15,000. Okay, and then just as a reminder, this Saturday on May 2nd is Clean Up Foxboro Day uh, to make sure that everybody comes out and helps clean up Foxboro. Um, and it sounds like the weather's gonna be great, so I hope everybody shows up. All right, so it being around 710, would you like to come forward? Sure. We're going to discuss the Southeastern Regional School budget for fiscal year 16. Superintendent Lopes. Uh, so I, I know most of you uh, know me. My name is uh, Lou Lopes. I'm the superintendent at Southeastern, uh, going on my ninth year there. And uh, Steve Uden is the um, serves on the school committee and is the representative from Foxborough. Um, so what I thought I'd do today is uh, to start by just telling kind of a quick overview of, of, of some of uh, what's been going on at the school and so forth. And then um, and I'll give a, just a very quick overview of our total budget, but then really focus in on Foxborough because that's obviously. But uh, that being said, if there's anything 
uh, in the documents that we provided that you want me to get into more detail, I'd be glad to, to do that, but I want to respect your time and so forth. So, uh, um, you know, this year has really been a year of celebration for, for our school. Uh, we had completed a $34 million renovation project that was completed on time, uh, under budget, uh, and we were able to do it without any assessment increase to any of our nine communities. Um, and that's really allowed us to do some great things, expand some programs, and, um, and we're starting to see that pay off. Uh, uh, not just uh, that, that we have a record number of, of uh, enrollment, our enrollment is up four, four, almost four and a half percent uh, from the previous year, and it's going to continue. We see that continuing to grow, not because we're accepting more students, but because um, we're, we're enrolling students in programs that they really enjoy and, and so forth. So what's happening is our upperclassmen size are very, is, is, is continuing to grow. Our dropout rate is less than 1%, uh, you know, which, uh, which is, is, is pretty spectacular. We also um, recognized as a level one school for our uh, academic achievement. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the commissioner of education cited our school as having the greatest gains in math MCAS as high school among any other school, uh, high school in the Commonwealth. Uh, you know, we, 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 you know, it helped that we had a ways to go, so, so you know, so it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Um, but, but, uh, but we're being successful not just academically, um, but also uh, on the career side. Um, quite a few of our students go on directly into work. We have a senior uh, cooperative education program where seniors can actually get paid and work out on industry. Uh, we've, we've increased that about 30% this year. Uh, in fact, um, uh, this year alone, our seniors will generate uh, over a million dollars worth of, of income that they've, that's their own money that's going to help support their families and so forth, which for our kids is very important. Over 60% of our students are on free and reduced lunch. So, uh, so, so some of those, that money uh, is critical for them to be able to afford, whether it's college uh, tuition expenses and things like that. So, um, so, so uh, that's kind of a quick overview of, of where we're at. Um, um, we, um, when doing our 2016 budget, we're, we're a school district that operates at, at what is called foundation budget or net school spending, meaning that, that, um, that we do not, um, we, whatever the minimum amount of, uh, of, of uh, co the minimum amount that, that the communities have to spend on education is what we base our budget on. Uh, we've been able to do that now for seven years. Um, I will say that in order to stay at foundation budget this year, uh, the school committee had to, had to dip into uh, our excess and deficiency account because of a new assessment uh, that we're faced with around state retirement. Uh, when the district was formed, um, uh, uh, people that were not part of the Mass Teachers Retirement, the district joined the uh, state retirement system. And, um, and it's always been the employees 100% funds that. Well, as a result of a federal audit by the, uh, on the state retirement board, they notified us that going forward, we were gonna have to make an employer contribution. Um, we still don't know exactly how much that's gonna be, um, but we estimated that it's gonna be somewhere between six to $800,000 a year. That, so, so we had to, uh, we were able to absorb half of it in the budget, and the school committee voted to pick up the other half out of their E&D funds. So again, that's not, uh, this year, next year at least, that's not gonna result in any increase in assessment to the community. So uh, we're working with the legislature to try to minimize the impact to the communities on that. So, and that's uh, been very well received. In fact, there's been some special legislation filed, that just got approved by the House and is now on the Senate side. So. I can, you know, keep you up to date on that if you're interested. Um, in terms of Foxborough, um, um, the, um, the, the, the uh, enrollment is up slightly. It's actually up 21%, uh, you know, which is, which is you know, it's, it's a relatively small number, uh, 23 students uh, in 2016. Um, and as a result of that, the assessment is up $62,000 uh, to 309000 094, which is an increase of 25 percent. So, percentage-wise, it's, it's 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 you know, it, it's it's uh, relatively large, but you kind of see how it follows the enrollment increase. Um, you know, I'll point. You know, there, there was a dip for a few years. We're starting to see a trend of the enrollment going back up. Uh, the 309,000 for 2016 is still less than what the assessment was in 2012. Uh, granted, there was uh, there's some there's you know some less students, but um, so, so that's really um, 
you know, on the assessment piece. One of the ways we're able to control that is um, in addition to our operating budget, we have transportation costs. As a regional school district, we're not allowed to charge for transportation. Uh, the state is supposed, to re is supposed to reimburse the communities uh, subject to, to, uh, to appropriation to, to, uh, to have the adequate am amount of money. So they, they typically, um, they funded as much as 90%. They've funded as little as 29%. Right now, it's, it's around, it's around uh, 60%. Um, we were able to look at our bus routes very closely, do some efficiency measures. We're actually reducing our transportation costs by almost 18 percent. So that was, that was, you know, that was, and that money um, it directly goes to the community. So that's, so those are the kind of things that we can do. In fact, out of the budget, the amount that, the, the increase of uh, 60, um, i trying to think what the increase is, is 60, 62,098, uh, 60,757 was, was actually uh, mandated by the Department of Education. The part that the school community and myself have control over is only $1,341. Um, so, so as you can see, there's, there's not a lot of wiggle room there in terms of us uh, trying to provide some relief to the communities. Um, that being said, you know, as our enrollment increases, uh, we're able to, to provide some great programs, um, and, uh, and, and that's led to, to being very successful. We have over 800 applicants already for, uh, for the incoming freshman class. We only accept uh, about 375. So for the first time, we'll actually have more people on the waiting list, unfortunately, than we're able to accept in, in our freshman class. Thank you. Thank you. To, to that point, I might add that the admission process um, is, is, is fairly rigorous for the students to come into the school. It's not an open door. And a, a lot of work before the students come in to Southeastern during the application process, they may have to have their feet to the fire in the Foxborough Public School Systems to get grades to a level that's acceptable to move forward in the admission processes at Southeastern. So um, for the student, if, if, if he or she really wants to go to that school, they have to demonstrate an effort to want to get into that school. And that's a cooperation between the community, the families of the students, and the student themselves. And, and we've seen that firsthand. And, and also, um, the feedback I've received from parents whose students have made it in, it has been very positive. And for the people at home, if there's any feedback that they want to give me otherwise, uh, I'm in the book and easy to access. So um, I just want to make it clear that it's, it's not easy to get in the Southeastern. And once it is, it's a really valuable experience for the students. And it's a type of student that goes there. Any questions on the budget? Yeah, not so much on the on the budget and, and Superintendent Lopes. I, mm -hmm. The last couple of years you've been in here, some of the questions you've been hearing, how are you keeping the costs down? And, and I remember busing, the mm -hmm. busing schedules and, and being creative was one of them. So it sounds like you're, you're still doing that. With respect to Foxborough, it looks like there's about eight, eight or nine or so towns where 1.6 of the entire population. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't seem like there's any rhyme or reason to the different schools enrollment so you go back eight years some of them gone up some of them gone down we're actually lower than we were when you started mm -hmm. presenting this data so if I was from Foxborough and the enrollment has gone down since its beginning but maybe it's up from the last couple of years is it because Foxborough students are applying and not getting in or they're not applying or, or do you do marketing to get people to understand what the school's about yeah, I mean, we're, we're obligated to inform every eighth grader um, of their right for a free public vocational education if they so choose. Um, when you see the dips, what, you, what, what, what I find with these dips is if you have a small freshman class, that dip carries for four years. So, so what happens is you see it going down, and then it starts to come back up. So, you see, so, so, so we tend to see these four-year kind of fluctuations on, on a, you know, you can see the same thing in Mansfield and West Bridgewater, I believe, have those kind of four-year dips. Uh, Easton was one of them that I just had just talked about, uh, had, had a similar situation where they dipped for four years and now they're going back up. Um, so you kind of see that. Um, in terms of 
applications, we're seeing the same number of applications. Um, um, I just did, a, on the way here, I did a, just a quick look up of, of the number of students have applied and how many have been accepted uh, of the, the incoming freshmen, and it's about 40% have been accepted. So, uh, you know, so if you figure about, you know, 800 applicants, that's not far off, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's about half. So, so, and we still have, we still have about 125 openings. So, so we have, we're, we're by no means done with the application process. Um, and, and it's not just grades. In fact, uh, it, we follow what's called a blind admission. So we're not allowed to uh, look at where they come from, or if they're special ed, or, 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 or whatever. So, but we do look at, um, uh, they get points for grades, attendance, behavior, mm -hmm. um, and, and an interview. Uh, and then and we just start going down from the top till we get to 375. That, that admissions policy is set by the state. Uh, we, and we, if we follow it, it's a very open process. Anyone that asks can get a copy of the list and mm -hmm. so forth. So, so, it's blind, so you don't know which student, which it town isn't. is represented? No, until so, so after. So say grades and, and participate, all that stuff. <coughs> I, How I, far does that go back? Just uh, It's grade? two years, and I'll tell you that, 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 where we see. Oh, good time. <laughs> I think that was me. Um, I think um, uh, if I had to, to see where where there's been some challenges is seventh grade attendance for some reason seems to be an issue for some kids and that's you know that's and they lose you know lose some significant points for that uh, in Foxborough I don't see so much behavior issues being you know they seem to that doesn't seem to be an issue but but really attendance and grades um, you know uh, are you know although behavior is a big part that's probably the biggest percentage points because you know um, we feel that if, if, if someone's going to make an effort and they can they show up to school, I mean, just like any school, the, the, then we're going to be able to educate them and make them successful. But if they don't show up, it's very hard for us to make them successful. And it, it, in our eyes, it's not fair to the community to be paying that assessment, you know, that amount of money, um, you know, and, you know and, and us not being able to educate them. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, in reading through the uh, materials that you provided, um, there's factors affecting assessment, mm -hmm. but how is the assessment actually calculated? So, so um, since um, um, 2001, um, the state uses what's called a aggregate wealth model for assessments. So the total amount that we, we get the, the same amount per student from all nine communities. The difference is in how much state aid each community gets. So a, a city like Brockton, which is 60% of our students, they get about, you know, eight, nine thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, twelve thousand dollars, I think, per um, per student in state aid, um, and they so they pay percentage-wise their assessment. So 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 under the formula, the the wealthier you are and the um, um, the more you pay, but it's also based on the number of students. So so what you'll see in Foxborough in a separate attachment. Um, Overall, um, Foxborough's in student age population is down. Uh, uh, f uh, how many students here? The, is down 39 students or so. Um, went from 2007-62 down to 2007-28. Not a significant number. And, and we've seen it, I've seen in some communities where they've seen a huge decrease. And that's actually when we did our. Our, our renovation project, we looked at 10-year projections. I'm sure you have those and you know what the projections are going to be. Um, so, so you say, well, we have less students. Why is your assessment going up? You know, Because under the aggregate wealth model, what the state says is you still, your property values are actually going up. So the good news in Foxborough is your growth is 4.7%, which is almost double the state average. So, so, so the state says, well, okay. There's less kids, but Foxborough can afford more money, so we're going to give you less state aid. So that's why it's it's kind of this. It's all it's it, there's a lot of factors there that go into that, but that's why you see that disparity among assessments. The bottom line we get is the same amount. It's just a matter of who we, do we get it from the how much state aid, how much the community gets assistance from the state, and it's affected by. So so in reality, the more students you have the less you pay, <laughs> which is kind of an odd formula, but it's really true. And, and I think David's question is probably the most common question we get from town leaders, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen this with other communities when we've been talking about going out on the, the road show, if you will, here. Mm -hmm. um, that's a spot-on question. 
-hmm. Thank you. Ginny, do you have any questions? Um, I, I just want to say I, I did go to the open house during the fall, mm -hmm. and I was very impressed with, um, with, the, with the school, but I was really impressed with the way the students were discussing their, their experiences mm -hmm. with the parents of the prospective students. I mean, the, these people were very mature, they were very well spoken, and they were very proud of their school. And it, I, I was very impressed. So you've done a wonderful job. Thank you. And Thank their you. craft. I mean, they <laughs> love showing yeah. off yeah. their skills. I learned, I learned very remarkable. quickly that, that no matter what I say, the kids can say it much better than I can. Right. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's That's hard. true. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Wow. But I just, just um, we have a Warren article before us in, uh, at the annual town meeting for the stabilization yes. fund. And um, could you just speak to that? Sure. Uh, so, so, um, so the so so um, being a regional school district, we're not allowed. There's, we can't put money aside for for long range capital planning, with, uh, unless we have what's called a stabilization account. It's the only means that we can we can man, we can if if, if there ever a situation where there is a little bit of a of a um, surplus or, or whatever we can put we can put up to five percent towards this stabilization account if it's a voted and approved by the school committee and the majority of the communities what what the reason for, for the stabilization account is um, we had just spent a quite a bit of money on the school and we want to make sure that we maintain that building uh, and we want to pre preserve uh, you know, preserve it through not just an annual maintenance plan, but as anyone knows, you, you know, there's this five-year, ten-year capital planning that you need to do. In order for in order for us to do multi-year capital planning, we need a stabilization account. We don't have any other means because we operate at foundation budget, so we have to spend the money to meet minimum contribution. So we don't have any other means. So so basically, right now, without a stabilization <coughs> fund, we're faced with having to fix things on an annual basis. And, which is fine for small things, but if there's a new roof or, or a, you know ma you know major cost, we can't spread that out over multiple years. So it really makes planning very difficult for us. So this warrant article is just giving you permission as a participating town. Correct. We're going to give you permission to set up that stabilization. That's fund, correct. And it will not cost the town no. any more money because it's you're just putting aside money correct, you already correct. have and, for and, use. Correct. And the goal is to not to to not ask for an assessment mm -hmm. um, it's to you know if you it, discussions with the school committee made it very clear that that we do have a pretty extensive adult evening program and post-secondary program and we would try to tap into those revenue sources to fund the stabilization account so that we don't have to ask for a separate assessment for capital improvements and things like that so um, you know so that's 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 what that allows us to do it is not to try to try to create an additional assessment. Any additional assessment would have to be voted and agreed but unanimously agreed by the majority of the of the uh, communities, you know, which, which we know would be very difficult anyway. So so you'd still have that ability to do that. And it actually would be more transparent because it would have to come before um, the, the it'd have to be presented at you know at the budget time. You know, if there was going to be any expense out of the stabilization account, would have to be part of that, and you would have the ability to to vote it down, basically. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Superintendent Lopes, you'd mentioned the uh, that you had to access the deficiency account. Yes. Um, so, if you're projecting that you'll have to contribute another six to eight hundred thousand dollars next year, is that what you're projecting? Do you have? Yeah. Um, so we. So so uh, so this year we're counting on five hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars of our E and D account, which is about half of it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, we we are able to to kind of backfill that through some through some receipts from rental the facilities and evening school and so forth. So so we typically backfill that you know several hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, so um, um, so so yeah. So going forward that may become an issue you know i don't know if we'll be able to sustain being a f being a foundation budget district with that assessment that being said um, we're not alone there's uh, 32 regional school districts and regional entities some of them not even school districts that are hit with this new assessment and and everyone understands that even it, and if you look at that affects about 137 communities so so there's broad support to um, to address this issue, um, 
um, because it's it's basically um, under the under the statute is we have to pay a hundred percent of the um, uh, uh, once someone's annuity is exhausted we pay a hundred percent of the bill for the rest of these people's lives and their spouses yeah. foreseeable future which which if you do any kind of uh, you know projection you know actuarial study that number is just going to start going through the roof so right. So, um, so we're so so, so th there's there's a will to try to address that, and, and I'm hoping that it's going to go through more of like what a lot of communities do. There's a employer portion that's paid each payroll period. Mm -hmm. That's something that we can plan and budget for, as opposed to an unforeseen. You know, you get a bill in January where half your half of your year has already gone by. You know, so it's hard yeah. to it's hard to budget for that. Thank you, Bill. Do you have any? Questions or comments? Yes, one of the questions I was, I was actually pleased to see. Um, I think your budget actually seems very reasonable to me. The, the one question I did have was, how did you keep your health insurance so low? Yeah, we're, like we're, yeah, we're part of the Gateway Group. Uh, a few mm -hmm. years ago, we did the um, we, we did start offering a GIC like plan, mm -hmm. uh, which increased the premiums a little bit, um, and. Um, it just we, we were fortunate I mean they've been usually around four percent or so uh, and I think was it one one and a half percent or one percent one percent yeah um, significant and it is yeah <laughs> it's a, yeah that's just contrary contrary yeah. to the entire market right so, right um, so. we you know I don't know the answer to that other than um, um, I, I have seen people less into the indemnity side and more into the HMO side. That that obviously helps a little bit. Um, and just it's our it's our claim. You know, we're we're part of the Gateway Group, which is more of the South Shore Group. Um, in fact, we're the most northern uh, school in that group. So so we typically have lower rates. If the way it was explained to me, because most of those it's kind of the the medical costs down the South Shore are a little you know less likely to go up to Boston and, and have those kinds of expenses. So. Um, so is that a joint purchase group? It is. Okay. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It was formed. Uh, we used to be part of the Plymouth County about 10 years ago, and they, they were looking at 18 percent increases, and they sw formed this group. So um, it's been very successful for us. Impressive. Um, but uh, actually, Randy helped helped me quite a bit a few years ago um, with the uh, pre with uh, trying to trying to get those rates under control. Okay. So I want to thank Very him good. for that. Thank you. All right. So. Um, do we need to take a vote to support your budget, or is this informational? Yeah, I think it's just informational. Okay. Like, again, okay. I don't know what your town pro, you know, process it is. Gets, but it, it gets goes. submitted as part of our budget process. Yes. Um, it will be involved. It will, it will be part of the warrant okay. um, for consideration. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, thank you very much for coming. You're welcome. Thank it's you. Very interesting. Thank you. Very much. How's Steve doing? Thank you. Huh? How's Steve doing for you? You're tolerating him. Don't want weak. Okay. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, discussion with the board regarding the growing opiate addiction problem. We've invited, uh, at our last meeting, we had a presentation uh, from Jim and Linda Walsh and Chris Long on this topic. And, you know, we talked about bringing someone in here just to give us a little bit more background on it. And I was um, wanted to bring Susan Panacho and Chief O'Leary if you want to join Susan at the table also in case there's any questions that come up you're welcome to come up and then uh, when Susan's finished I wanted to invite Linda and Chris back up to talk again about the program that's coming up in May okay. so just by way of introduction Susan uh, works for CRC Habit Opco she's a licensed alcohol and drug counselor also a licensed mental health counselor with experience working for DCF uh, she's worked in the non-for-profit and for-profit field uh, of addiction treatment. Also um, has worked for emergency rooms and crisis centers and uh, currently has her own outpatient private practice. So Susan, thank you for coming. Thank you for Appreciate inviting me. Um, so Lorraine had <coughs> asked me to come and speak a little bit about um, sort of the growing epidemic regarding opiate addiction um, that's been happening. And for those of us that work in the field, we've been seeing it happen, I think, much quicker than folks in the community. It's just now it's hitting a level where it really cannot be ignored. Um, so as, as recent as March of 2014, Governor Deval Patrick declared a public health emergency in the state of Massachusetts in response 
to the growing opioid addiction epidemic. Um, he specifically directed the Department of Public Health to take several action steps to combat overdoses. So it's not just that there was this growing um, problem with people developing an addiction, but not really seeking treatment in a timely way and accelerating in their use in such a drastic way that it was leading to unintentional overdose and not knowing how to respond um, to these overdoses or potential overdoses or even knowing how to identify them really led to some eye-opening experiences and a great deal of fear and concern in particular because the overdose the overdoses that were occurring we were starting to see happen in an age group that we really wouldn't be comfortable with not that any age group is comfortable but when you're looking at 15 16 17 year olds overdosing on opiates it becomes alarming so two things have, there's quite a few things that have happened since, since March of 2014, but two specific things that have really have impacted and, and started to move things in a very positive uh, direction was permitting all first responders to carry and administer naloxone or Narcan, which is a safe and effective opioid antagonist to reverse overdose. So training first responders, having that on board, being able also to train family members or anyone who would like to, um, to be able to dispense it has really created a huge um, impact. They're also required to document. So if you do um, re receive the brief training on how to administer Narcan and you do administer it, you're asked to report that to the state so that they can keep track of how many times it's happened and if it's being effective, it's, if it's working. The other thing that they really pushed on was um, accelerating a mandatory use of prescription monitoring programs. So years ago, it was an option. If you went to a primary care physician or a pharmacist and you were filling a prescription for any type of opiate, um, it was an option, voluntary, whether or not they wanted to run a prescription monitoring, uh, your name through a prescription monitoring program, which would just indicate if, in fact, you had recently filled another prescription of that type. Now they're pushing to say it's mandatory. If someone comes in seeking treatment, you know, brand new patient to a PCP, they're, they're complaining of pain, they need um, pain medication. They're really saying it's your responsibility to run this just so that we can curb if there's misuse or abuse happening. Um, so those, those are two of many things that they're really trying to push um, along with some centralized areas in the state of Massachusetts that are working on overdose prevention and building community task force and really trying to make a collaborative effort collaborative effort towards working on this problem. So just today, you know, we were talking about how we had heard that um, the newest statistics for 2014 have recently come out and that sadly, you know, the overdose has hit a little over 1,000 in the state of Massachusetts for, the, for 2014. Prior to that, in 2013, they had confirmed about 902 fatal opioid um, overdose deaths and 863 of them were unintentional. So it, it's, the numbers sort of speak for themselves. Um, so with that being said, you know, we're clearly aware that it's a problem. We know that it's a problem and it's sort of like, okay, well now what are we doing? Um, the epidemic is felt everywhere. Uh, we can begin at looking at the impact in our hospitals. So as Lorraine mentioned, I've worked in, both in ERs typically on the weekend overnight shift, so those are a lot of fun um, and long. And what we get on the weekends is anyone who is struggling a great deal with an addiction. Typically, for some reason, we don't see it as much Monday through Thursday, but Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the ERs are inundated. And there isn't enough support to really meet their need. So what happens is when they find somebody who has any type of addiction background, you're that go-to person. Because oftentimes they're frustrated, they're seeing this person for the fourth or fifth time in the last six months, you know, what are you doing here? We, we already sent you in, why are you back again? This is the kind of language that we hear, you know, unfortunately sometimes professionals using. And not because they, they're not empathic, but they're frustrated. They don't know what else to do. And a hospital ER isn't necessarily the ideal place to provide treatment and support for somebody struggling with an addiction. 
So they'll call on social workers, some of which who have addiction background, but many of which do not. So I know in preparing for my master's degree, I took one class in three years. I was a three, it was a three-year full-time program on addictive disorders. Everything else that I learned about addictive disorders I did through obtaining my secondary license postgraduate. So unfortunately, while someone might be licensed in the field, they may have very little experience with this particular problem. So then you'll see that crisis centers also get inundated. And for, I don't know how familiar folks are with a crisis center, but most crisis centers are addressing outpatient mental health issues. When I first started working in a crisis center about 11 years ago, again, I did it part-time per diem, um, I remember seeing folks come in, you know, there was glasses everywhere. We have to buzz folks in for our own safety because we don't know what, what's happening and why people are coming in. And then we do a brief assessment or screening to kind of to figure out is they, they're safe enough to sit with us for an evaluation? Do we need to call some support? And oftentimes, I remember seeing clinicians, again, not with any malintention, but this is the way the field looked at it, would come in and say, it's just, it's drug use. Give them a detox list, give them a phone, and let them know that they have to call. And these folks would sit in a waiting room and make phone calls to detoxes by themselves, not knowing necessarily what they were going to get on the other line. And there was no assistance because the thought was, we are not an addiction treatment center. This is a mental health. Crisis centers are for mental health. And it was, now the good news is that changed a great deal in that crisis center and in part because of myself and two other clinicians that really worked a great deal with, um, in other facilities with addiction and really provided that support and said that makes no sense. We need to complete a full evaluation regardless of what they say their reason is, is or isn't and we need to figure out what we can do to help them. Even if at minimum some of them c came in with family members, even if we can talk to the family about what they can do. So it's shifted, but these are the things that these folks deal with when they realize that they have a problem. It's not as easy as we think it is to get the help that they need. Um, and then the, the very other tragic place and difficult place to manage is when we find out that someone has an opiate and addiction as a result of a baby being born who's dependent to opiates. So oftentimes you will see that women will risk not disclosing that they have an opiate problem for fear of what is going to happen in terms of treatment, judgment, will I find an OBGYN that understands my situation, is DCF going to get involved as soon as I give birth to this child, and not everyone's level of addiction is the same. So you'll see folks that manage their addiction for years without anyone knowing that they've had a problem other than those that are very close to them. And so what they do is they try to manage it on their own. We, most hospitals now are a standard where they test babies. And so if their meconium comes back positive, which is their first stool, if their meconium comes back positive for any substances, typically some type of DCF involvement is made. Doesn't necessarily mean to open a case, but they bring it in. The dangerous part is had we known that the mother was opiate dependent, their treatment would have been different while they were pregnant versus not knowing. So how do we support folks who have an addiction to be able to reach out and ask for help is really crucial. Um, and then we t I spoke a little bit about primary care physicians, the struggle they have. And then finally, the biggest ones outside of the folks that are actively using are their families. I feel that all too often they're the forgotten folks. Um, I started speaking or started being invited to speak at some chapters with Learn to Cope. I don't know how familiar folks are with that, but it's a great program. Um, it's a peer-led peer group for family members of those who have an addictive disorder. I think right now there's about 12 chapters. One of them meets in Brockton. That was my first experience. I walked in and there were 52 people there. 52. I, I walked in and I was shocked. And I only had like 25 minutes to speak and I didn't leave. And the line, they had to ask that they take it outside because the line of parents that were in front of me wanting to ask me additional information about what else they could do. So again, it's not just something that stigmatizes the individual with the addiction. 
it stigmatizes that family. They then start to fear seeking help and asking for help because they don't want to out themselves. Um, and some of the things that I've heard them say and some of the, the struggle that I see is really looking at um, <clears throat> their frustrations continue to increase because there's such a significant change in the presentation of the person. That is not them. Someone who's impaired does not behave normally. So if we've ever been over-medicated after a surgery, we know that we're not operating as our normal self. And with addiction, it's, it's tenfold. So this is overbearing and painful for families. The families start to search for cures, answers, resources. All the while, they're worrying, are they out in the street? Are they going to die today? Should I give them money? Should I not give them money? Um, should I kick them out? Should I not kick them out? You know, what is the right answer? <clears throat> They'll go back and forth with whether or not they can trust what that person says, how much they can trust what they say. And these questions, fear, and anxiety just go on and on, and it brings a lot of family and loved ones to a breaking point. I've seen marriages fall apart. I've seen families separate and become divided as to how to best handle this. It's, it's really debilitating. Um, and so <clears throat> oftentimes I, I listen to families and the biggest thing is they'll ask themselves time and time again, like, did we do something wrong? You know, what did we do? Why is my, you know, child doing this? And it has nothing to do with really anything other than the fact that we have access to mood altering substances at a rate that we've never experienced before. You know, I have three children and I always say, I have no idea what could possibly happen because they spend very little time in my care. You know, you work, they're in school, they're at games, they're with friends. You have no idea what they could potentially be exposed to. And the rate of exposure is at a much higher rate. Even via the internet, recently there was something on the news where they're ordering different substances called different things and when you get it, it's synthetic and it's creating some significant problems for the kids that are taking this. So um, what I can say is there are a lot of wonderful things that are happening. So sometimes we need something to kind of like shake us in order to bring us together because most of us do have the resources. We just need to be more collaborative in our efforts. So some of the things that I've seen pro uh, communities do is they are developing task force, tasks task force, I'm sorry, I've been up since 4.15 at this, so I'm a little <laughs> tired. Um, and the ones that I find are the most effective are the ones that have the participation of their local law enforcement um, providers who are really invested not in selling their programs, but in working towards providing support and resources. The big, one of the biggest challenges with opiate addiction in particular is that there is such a strong societal view about how to get sober, how to recover. Should it be abstinence? Should it be medication assisted? Should it be residential? Personally, I think it's up to that person who's afflicted by the disease, not anybody else. And if something works for them and they're building their life and they're demonstrating improvement, we really are in no place to make a judgment or a call as to how they should or shouldn't proceed with their recovery. The stigma, definitely, we talked, I mentioned a little bit of that, impacts it. Access to resources and understanding levels of care. I left a resource for you folks. I developed this a while ago. I do a lot of training and consultation. These are all the different levels of care available in the state of Massachusetts. And underneath it will tell you the criteria. What most people don't understand is based on your insurance, and what your current symptoms are, and your symptoms could change within two or three days. So depending on when you last used, how often you've been using, what's on board, you could present one way today and three days later, you're no longer meeting the criteria for that level of care. I've seen people with addiction say, you serious? I have to go out and get high in order to get in to get help? So, and I'm not being critical of treatment centers, I'm just saying we need to really revisit the pressures that insurances place on us for this disease and looking that it's a much bigger problem than simply did I just use yesterday or not. Um, and so <clears throat> most families are not aware of this. So when they do try to help 
you know, their family, their loved ones to get into treatment, they realize it's not so easy. Their insurance mm -hmm. may or may not um, accept them. So as Lorraine said, I, I, I have a private practice and oftentimes because I like to speak and just get the word out, um, it's something I love doing. I don't know why, but I do like working with this population. It's really a blessing to see how much somebody can change their life when they do get clean and sober and just like how excited they are about the fact that it's possible and, and, and as well as their family. So oftentimes I'll get referrals or people will call. I just had a mother who wants me so badly to work with her son and the insurance has denied it twice because they're not accepting new providers and there's enough providers on the list. So these are the frustrations that, so I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm still working with him regardless. It is what it is. <laughs> um, at least a couple of sessions to kind of help the family. But the fact that we can't even choose who we want to work with, you know, that's frustrating. Um, so I hope that, um, I did look a little bit in terms of the statistics within this um, area and um, it looks like, I think Stoughton, I was looking at the county, Stoughton and one other area actually has doubled in overdoses in the last 10 years, but all the others seem to have a slower <laughs> increase, which is good. And this would be the perfect time to really build that community support, resources, prevention, education, you know, looking at how can we get Narcan available to those folks that may potentially need to have it. Maybe they have a child, an adolescent who they suspect is using. It could save their life. So um, anything that I can do to offer help, I'll leave my cards here. People can feel free to give me a call and just thank you for having me. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Ed, did you want to comment at all about uh Certainly, uh, the presentation gives us, I think, a, a good picture of the lack of resources that are available uh, for people that do have problems with drug abuse. Uh, the district attorney stopped by at the police chief's meeting earlier this month, and he rattled off some figures because he's been working diligently uh, on different programs and looking at it on a regional basis. We actually had more people die of drug overdoses in the county last year than we did in motor vehicle crashes. Uh, the ages range from 16 to 63 uh, and involved a cross-section of socioeconomic conditions for the people. Uh, a lot of the programs that we're doing now with the pharmacies are a result of working with the district attorney's office. He's actually hired a pharmacist to try and train workers at the pharmacies about using databases of doctors and patients and medications to track where people uh, are getting the initial opioids that eventually, uh, in most cases, transfer over to other drugs such as heroin. Uh, and when we have a ring of uh, crimes or break-ins, very often when my staff does make arrests, we find that the people have severe addictions. And if you think about $200 a day uh, going towards paying for somebody uh, that is really uh, a hardcore heroin user and needs to take 15 to 20 injections a day just to stay normal, that's what they're looking at. And we probably look at our own family budgets and figure, well, where would we come up with $1,400 a week? Mm -hmm. uh, and with people that don't have a skill set, perhaps because of their addiction, to get gainful employment. Uh, so it, it's something that is really crucial to our community. And, and I was thrilled uh, when Linda and Chris, you know, have come up with a concept to start putting us as a community on the right track to start taking steps now to hopefully reduce the risk of families here in Foxborough. Because it's not enforcement. <laughs> uh, that ship sailed a long time ago, but we have to find ways of some prevention and some uh, mitigation to make things easier for the families that have somebody <coughs> in the household that has developed an addiction uh, and probably don't have the skill set to adequately deal with it. 
Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Susan or Ed? No? I just, just very briefly, Susan, thank you for coming in. Um, You're welcome. You know, having three children and working with what you do. I mean, you were on our docket for 20 minutes, and I know you probably could have spoken for 20 hours on this topic. Um, very important. Um, but the one thing that you said is collaboration. And, you know, law enforcement, funding, the government, uh, social services, um, the clergy down to the funeral director. It's a community-wide issue. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's starting to get headway here. It's kind of late in the game on, on s many levels. But I think you're going to start seeing it when you hear the police reports of people breaking into homes and they're going to put two and two together. <laughs> and it's not going to be too long when we have a death of one of the young kids that is really going to send the catalyst in when something that like that happens and there's no place to go for the family or for direction, th that's why I think it's so important to at least start talking about this and getting it out so it's not the taboo and people f start feeling comfortable that so-and-so is a heroin addict and you can talk about it because it's not going to get better. And this, and this scares it, the life out of me. The, the, yo the younger kids across the board, they're getting younger and younger and the general population is going to be very surprised. You see it every day, but the average person, if you ask, they don't. And, it, and it's, it's here and it's coming and, and worse. So thank you for your time for coming You're in. Welcome. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Come on up, Chris. Can I ask a couple questions? Sure. Um, Do you want to come up to the microphone, Chris, please? I'm loud enough. <laughs> <All right. laughs> a couple questions for you. Chris um, Long. For me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, where is a crisis center in Massachusetts for addiction? Um, so there, so we don't have them, and that's part of the problem. So, but all crisis centers, and this is what I meant. So, every county, and I actually can send you a list that tells you sort of, you know, all the towns and the surrounding towns. Every surrounding town or section has a crisis center. The problem becomes, what is the culture of that crisis center? What's the philosophy? So the one that I was working in, when I, as I said, when I first started working there, you know, eight years ago, the mentality was if you came in and you looked like you were high or you looked as though it was a primary addiction, right. it was here's a detox right. list and have a nice day. Exactly. It wasn't even have a discussion with them, find out what's going on. When I left, we were we were completely doing different things we were even paying for you know cab rides to get them to a detox because right. that's the other thing they could get into treatment but then how do we get them there and there's no assistance to help them get there so there were some of us that were just like you know it doesn't matter we'll get them there um so you're right there isn't something specific for addiction okay sadly. and then as far as treatment centers um the detoxes mm -hmm. um yeah, it's ridiculous that kids have to get high before they go into a treatment. They won't. You walk in and you, you don't test dirty, they kick you out. But there's not enough beds. Correct. So a couple of things that she is right about. So there's, a, there's definitely a lack of beds, but there's also a lack of resources. So for example, when, when somebody with an addictive disorder is on their last stretch, They've burned all their bridges. They're homeless. They're living on the street. Mom and dad are saying, you can't come back in here. Like, we can't take it anymore, which is understandable because sometimes the presentation gets really ugly. I'm sure that, you know, folks have, some folks have seen that. They, their primary issue may be addiction, but then sometimes what you'll see is some fabrication of symptoms to now get into other beds. So because we're not the identifying, right, so because we're not identifying the problem correctly to begin with, right. it's hard to then allocate additional spending for something that we really cl clearly can't identify. It's, it's definitely a vicious cycle. I'd like to see specific treatment settings just for that, but maybe someday. Um, you talked about the testing of the poop from the baby. Yes. How long yeah. has that been going on? It's happening more often and depending on what hospital. So each hospital has its own set policy. But a lot more hospitals are doing that simply because it's just like with anything, it's to help prepare as to how to manage the baby. Um, some OBGYNs are now making it a standard to test pregnant mothers. And again, it's because of the concern, not that they're trying to get people into trouble, but if you do have an opiate dependence or drugs on board, your treatment as a pregnant mother needs to be different. It needs to be considered a high-risk pregnancy um, and be able to kind of, so that's the struggle that they're having. 
But again, to me, it goes back to we should be facilitating an environment where mothers should be more open to saying, I need help. And that's what we need to push towards. But in the meantime, I think providers are trying to do the best they can to, to, to make sure that a mother is safe and that a newborn is safe. Thank you. Chief, I have one question for you. Does Patriots Place ever get any ambulances with overdoses? You know how they're uh, urgent care or do you have any idea? Uh, no, I don't. I've been talking with uh, Jim Grenier that maintains the uh, transport logs to try and get some idea of how many patients we're actually sending uh, either from homes other doctors offices or places like the urgent care to find out if there's a percentage uh, that's a significant issue but at this point I don't know that Chris one last thing on that statistics of the thousand mm -hmm. that's a soft number right well that's what's reported you know and so the nice thing is that there was also um, something that recently passed that's allowing us to better track this so prior to, and I, I can't quote the date because I don't know it for sure, but there was a time when, um, for example, if someone called 911 um, as a result of someone overdosing, oftentimes people were in fear of doing that because everyone would be arrested, especially if there were any narcotics on the premises. And now there is something that's happening in which only if somebody has a warrant would they be arrested, but if they're, if they're calling to get assistance for someone, because that was another thing, people were leaving you know, other folks who are overdosing by themselves. So it's only what's reported. We can only imagine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susan. Linda and uh, Chris, did you want to just give an update again for the program that's coming forward in May, please? Linda Walsh, I've planned that. Chris Long for Penny Terrace. Um, so we're definitely going to take one of these because every we pick up everything wherever we go. So yeah. um, thank you, Susan. We pick up what they put down. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So um, if you notice over here on the wall is one of our flyers. Uh, Deb Spinelli has it and is sending it out to all the PTO folks. Um, again, it will be the documentary. We'll have a panelist of uh, professionals to answer questions. Um, we're hoping maybe we can even get Susan to come. Yeah. <laughs> She's yeah. very impressive. Yeah. Um, you know, the, you know she, she mentions, and Jim had mentioned before, about the um, uh, Governor Patrick and Governor Baker putting money to it, but I'd love to see where that money is right now. Um, I guess we're waiting for a report. Um, I've gone online, and I've seen things up to 2014, um, but I haven't seen where that money is going so obviously we'd love to see that and more beds and facilities uh, available to us but what we can do at home is become aware of that it is here and um, give folks options of what they can do uh, who they can reach out to uh, facility wise and um, so that they understand that they're not alone that there are other other people out here um, so we are having that meeting uh, the movie on next May 6th. May 6th, which is next Thir Thursday. Thursday, yep. Yeah. Um, and then May no, it's 17th. Wednesday. Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? It's Wednesday. Less on Wednesday. Yes. Elections are Monday. Yeah, Monday, before. okay. So, um, <laughs> and that will be um, at Showcase Live. Yep, and um, we'll have information tables there as well as the speakers. And in then again in May, we're going to have a, uh, a walk for Steps of Hope at um, the Gillette Stadium. And it will just only be a mile um, just to bring awareness and so that um, bring togetherness of the family, the addict themselves, the recoverer, um, and, and professionals that, that want to come up there and have their information available to folks. <laughs> so um, little by little, you'll see more of this grassroots group of uh, of what we're calling raft yep. um, raising addiction awareness for Fox Fox Pro Pro team, team. <laughs> so um, but at any point anybody needs to reach out to us I'm in the book Linda Walsh and Chris I'm in the book yep so. and we're here and you know don't be ashamed because you're not alone right definitely not alone 
appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next item, Chief O'Leary, we're going to talk about the commercial parking regulations. Good evening. Good evening. So. Well, in terms of regulations, I was looking at uh, the current ones. I believe two years ago, uh, we did a revision mm -hmm. on uh, the regulations <laughs> that were in place. And uh, so it was in 2013. Uh, I did send out an email um, through the Route 1 businessmen's group uh, just to let them know that we're going to be looking at uh, the regulations and I didn't know whether there was anything specific that the board wanted to see looked at or improved and uh, in terms of revising them I would certainly want to have a working group as we did two years ago to have input from the people that are actually operating the various lots along the Route 1 corridor. I think the topic came up, Ed, because of uh, the recent inspections that were taken that there were certain lots that had excessively high numbers over their licensed figures. So um, I think at the time there was a concern that there was no penalty aspect to the regs, but in fact there is a penalty in, right, the, in the regulation. Right, uh, in section uh, 15. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a penalty for a first offense of $100 per violation. And I would read that, that each car over the allotted number would be a unique violation. Uh, because if uh, the price of parking 100 extra cars uh, and collecting $4,000, you only pay a $100 fine. Uh, even my limited business experience knows that that's not really a bad deal. Uh, but there is a penalty there. Uh, I think some of the feedback from the people that I spoke with uh, were reluctant, certainly, to have uh, the state police involvement. Uh, they had offered to do a service that uh, I couldn't get out uh, with more planning to do. Uh, but I know that this coming year, um, I'll put that as one of the multiple priorities that we have when we're doing events to have Foxborough people involved in doing uh, the verifications on the numbers. Uh, and, and why, why the Foxborough? When we say Foxborough people, you mean in the Foxborough police, right? Versus the state police. Why one versus the other? Well, uh, the captain that was running the detail offered that he had people available. Um, if you think of, uh, I don't know, a wave, uh, there are certain times that I have people available as people are entering the stadium. Mm -hmm. But as we fill to capacity, the people that I have are then engaged with the crowds that are there for the event. Um, they're the opposite. Their wave are the people arriving in cars, getting them into the lots so that once we corral everybody at an event, they're the ones that have capacity to go around and look at lots and do counts. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one of the reasons that it seemed to make sense at that time. Okay. Ginny, do you want to make a comment? Yeah, we had had a report, the report that the uh, state police did that brought this uh, to our attention. There right. were, you know, there were some lots that were like five cars over, but there was one lot that I believe was, if it wasn't 100, it was al almost 100, which is, that's pretty egregious right. over parking. Um, was that the first time that the parking lots had been checked to make sure that what they were licensed for, they were actually parking to that limit and not over that limit? Uh, to my knowledge, we haven't done any uh, regulatory inspections uh, ever. Uh, mm -hmm. I know at one point uh, when Chief Boswell um, had his people doing car counts uh, just to make sure that they had adequate width, and I know at different times Mr. Gaspara 
and the Deputy Fire Chief, uh, Steve Bagley, have gone out just to verify. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is something that, you know, I'm willing to take on as a task for my staff uh, to make sure that we do have compliance with the limits that are set by the size of the lot and the, its layout. And, and what did did anything uh, happen to the people who were egregiously over? Uh, did they I, did they get fined? No, uh, I sent them out letters uh, to those that were significantly over. I talked with the nine people uh, individually. Uh, making contact with them to go over you know what the regulations are and I felt that that initial warning to that group uh, was adequate uh, certainly if we go back and it's the same people then we would probably issue some type of fine mechanism uh, I would almost think that that would have to come before this board in order to again much like a liquor violation prove a case mm -hmm. have evidence have you know certainly representation by that lot operator uh, and then if they were in violation for the board to determine uh, the fine would be determined by how many cars over that particular lot is so in the regulations now is there a, a mention of a fine well the hundred dollars and mm -hmm. is that uh, per car for, I, I for perceive it to be uh, per car so that that's something that when you, we review the regulations would be tightened up so specifically a hundred dollars right. per cap per over so, so if you had if you had that that one particular lot and I, I don't even know who whose lot it was that was almost a hundred cards you know, agreed I would say right. egregiously over so what's happened what's happened since then I mean obviously land must have been cleared to do those extra hundred cars is it obvious now when, if, if, the, if there's an event there, is there a demarcation on where's the licensed part and uh, as opposed to what was the extra part? In, in other words, do the, when the lots, when you, when you license a lot, do you, ha, do you have like lines of demarcation, meaning, okay, from here to here, we're licensed for 56 cars? It depends on the nature of the lot. Mm -hmm. and how their staff members direct the traffic. Uh, in many cases, it's, you know, uh, on gravel lots, packed grass, uh, so it's hard to delineate exactly what the layout would be. It's not an organized shopping plaza lot where there are lanes of traffic, there are lanes of uh, parking stalls. Uh, so, so how about, all right, say if a, if a lot is licensed for 56 cars. Right. How about you have 56 pieces of paper that you can hang from your from your rearview mirror as the cars come in? One, two, three. When that 56th last piece of paper is given out, that's it. The lot's full. Well, is that something that could that could be uh, we could be make part of the regulations so we can control it? Certainly, you know the the board. And again, I would want input from the people that do it. Hmm. Uh, I know that in talking with people after this event, uh, you know, several of them use a method that you just described. Hmm. You know, they know what their parking limit is. Once they reach it, they close their lot because yeah. they don't want any particular problems. So, but but we could make that part of it. I mean, it's it's best practices for some people. We could make that best practices for everybody. Certainly, if you want to yeah. have a, a methodology, but I, I don't know whether that will fit all. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at least well, it, it would, would fit be a discussion it, it would fit if you're licensed for 75 cars and you only have 75 placards to, to give out at the car, then right. when that 76th car comes in, you don't have any more placards, so you can't pack them. I, you, know, you, you know, I'm concerned that the, the, the license holders who stick to the number of, of their, li their, their license spaces. I mean, it's unfair to them to have somebody parking 100 extra cars. So I, I should think that the uh, parking lot owners would be willing to uh, have a method to make sure that everybody is following the rules and regulations of the, of the commercial parking. You know, it's to their own benefit. Well, 
Yeah. We might perceive that. I don't know yeah. how the lot operators themselves would perceive it. And that's why it would probably be good to have mm. uh, a meeting and maybe a member of this board uh, be part of the subcommittee with myself. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't that. mind doing it. I did, I did right. it before two years ago, so I'd be okay. more than happy to do that. So if the board at some point, uh, if not tonight, I, I saw many of the operators have come tonight to listen mm. uh, as to what we'd be doing, and I know in talking with uh, one of them in particular, they would certainly want to participate with us. So, to um, those things. you can pull together a group with uh, the room. I'm certainly, uh, after this meeting uh, tomorrow morning, I'll put out an email and see what we can do to have a group together. Mm -hmm. I know that we're in the process of preparing the parking licenses coming out in July 1. It would be ideal if we were going to have, uh, and I know you know the board has a very tight time schedule in terms of meetings, uh, if we could come back with the board so that prior to the issuance of fiscal 16, uh, if there were going to be any amendments to the current licenses, those could be incorporated, mm -hmm. which and is a tight two months. At the time of renewal, Ed, if someone had over the years somehow decided they were needed to park or were going to park a hundred more cars but they could apply for a higher number for the license correct right uh, you know if, as right. people develop their property or lose property to other uses mm -hmm. you know they can amend their license mm -hmm. that okay. fits their need uh, at that point they do have to bring up uh, plans that are then reviewed by the fire service for turning radius issues with the bigger pieces of equipment mm -hmm. uh, but yes they they have an opportunity uh, if they have expansion you know they've mm -hmm. taken out some trees okay. they could get another 15 or 20 cars in they could approach the board you know for a request for uh, additional licenses okay great so can I ask for a little clarity where we're, we haven't gone through this before with the fines and the penalties right. It sounds like you're you're running a compare, uh, an analogy, the liquor licenses and the fines for parking. If you read the liquor licenses, a set process for public right. hearings. If I read the regulations, it says you know criminal or a hundred dollar fine. I didn't read that that you issue a fine, they have to come in front of the okay. selectmen. So, as the group forms and, and moves forward, at least could we get some clarity? If he wants to issue a fine, I read it as you issued the fine if they wanted to appeal it maybe they come in front of the selectmen or, or okay. a different level but if you issue six fines I did not expect six public hearings to talk about a hundred dollar <coughs> process on this so can we get some clarity okay. uh, you know, certainly there are, are different bylaws uh, that a civil penalty can be assessed whether it's uh, through the building commissioner's office uh, for example, the use of uh, marijuana in a public space is a $200 fine that a person would get a ticket that they would then pay. So, uh, yeah, and, and the regulations the, do reference MGL chapter, right, whatever. So, it is. if so it's it might be answered that, there, you know, that's something we could certainly look in. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know what involvement the board might want to have in this process. And I know really with all that is happening within our community, uh, you don't have a lot of free time to uh, tie yeah, in. Th and, and that's why I'm saying I don't right. expect a line of people coming in here no. to get well, a fine from us. I, I, another alternative, yeah. um, and the chief and I haven't talked about this, but but there is, you know, the, the town manager is, is supposed to be a hearing officer, which I, I could serve in that capacity and listen to those appeals if, if brought to my attention as well. <laughs> Um, I could handle that part of it so it wouldn't come to the board in that case. So, but there, certainly there's, some, there's a lot of room for discussion on this because um, it, coming to light the last year was a little bit disturbing to see that, that, that some operators were operating ex ex exceptionally high based upon what their license capacity was. And I think that needs to be addressed because we want everybody to be consistent about it. Uh, otherwise, it's the, you really don't, what's the purpose of having a license? Mm -hmm. So I think we want that to be tightened up, and I think uh, meeting with the operators I think is a good thing to do, to do that, to have that conversation, and then uh, see if there's any gaps in the, in, the, in the procedure that needs to be tightened up. 
I'd be happy to, to assist in that process too. Okay. Anything else? <coughs> Thank you. Yes. Any questions from the uh, audience? You want to come to the microphone? Ellen Davis, 200 North Street. Um, not question really, but a comment. Um, I'm not sure if all the licenses are similar to the one that I have on North Street. Mine is a um, temporary parking lot. Um, the application, I, I believe just last year from the selectman's office said that the number of spaces could not be expanded upon. Um, it has never said that before, but I believe just last year's letter said that. And the other question I have is um, the enforcement of so we're talking tonight about the fines that are out there for the licensed lots. Um, I believe there's a similar vehicle in place for residential parking that uh, specifically North Street, Main Street, some of the issues we had in the past years, I've brought it up to members of the board here. Um, there is also a vehicle to fine uh, folks that don't have licenses at all. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what the board's opinion of that is and um, what actions you might do moving forward with that. Thank you. Um, Ellen, I think in terms of that language about not increasing the number of spaces, I, you know, I don't recall it being discussed in front of the board, but um, to me it makes sense if someone has the ability to do that, that, you know, as long as they're willing to pay the application process. Does everybody agree that that makes um, sense? Actually, Deb and I was talking about this before the meeting and she said that um, that particular um, Bill Kasparov was Bill Kasparov made, um, made that uh, call last year and we put it on the memo that they could decrease spaces but could not increase spaces oh, okay. last year. Well maybe we can just find out well, um, and what yeah. that's in response to. And I think to. that would mean that Bill Kasparov should actually be involved also in, in the right. review well, of the would, regulations. Yeah. I, would, I, would, I would actually yeah. be involved in this. Yeah. I know that he has uh, taken on a lot of the issues about the non-licensed operations that have happened and mm -hmm. built up uh, and has done, uh, taken some people to court because of uh, their aggressive uh, parking operations in neighborhoods. And, and, and just, then, oh. I was just going to say in terms of enforcement of the non-licensed lots. Are there, you know, planned at, or is there a plan for that? Well, we've done it in the past uh, and would certainly continue it uh, as part of an overall safety thing for the neighborhoods because there are people, a few houses that don't seem to be operating, uh, friends and neighbors every weekend or private party uh, operations which uh, cause concern. Okay. In, in getting back to North Street, we have that ongoing problem of the, um, you know, limos, cabs, you know, idling during events, waiting for people to pick up people, and uh, we were supposed to get those signs on North Street to address that problem. But that that should be something we should be. Right, they, they've been ordered. From my understanding. Yeah. Right, uh, Chris yeah. Gallagher and I have had conversations. Yeah. We've gone up and uh, resurveyed mm -hmm. the area because some of the signs have faded mm -hmm. over the last mm -hmm. 40 years that they've been up. <laughs> and uh, also to have wording about not just parking, but standing, which would be, you know, a live parking situation. Right. So that, you know, people could take more action on it. Right. Uh, and, and, and the taxis do idle. I had, I had occasion where I had to take a taxi cab to Rodman Ford to pick up my car. And... Um, I was just talking to the taxi driver and he was telling me all about how they idle when we're waiting for, and I'm thinking, oh my God, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it is, it, it was anecdotal before, you know, but I mean, the taxi driver told me that. He said there'll be 15 taxis li lined up and people doing exactly what, um, what Ellen said at the, at the meeting we had, you know, disposing trash, just, you know. So I mean, there's, there's problems on North Street. Right. That, and you know, possibly on other streets, right, such as right. Pine Street uh, right. and other locations. Uh, getting back to that, uh, the stadium at some shows have tried to have uh, a drop-off and pick-up area 
uh, <coughs> especially when they do like a Taylor Swift, uh, mm. one of the uh, One Direction shows, and that seems to clog the traffic even worse because now parents are coming into the grounds at 9.30, they're trying to find spots to park and then getting additional cars then out of the facility uh, certainly makes it a longer commute mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Yeah, and, and I was told by the, the taxi driver that um, he was not allowed to bring people into the stadium area. That was uh, forbidden by the, um, I mean, this is what he told me, the stadium personnel, and that was one of his um, concerns, complaints. Yeah. Well, if you remember during some of the shows that we had last season, when they weren't using the luxury suites as much, uh, we tried a test program on Putnam Pathway mm. in which cabs for some of the shows were able to go in and out mm -hmm. uh, to see if that would be more effective. Uh, and I found it very effective for getting people at the end of the show, uh, they could queue <coughs> within a lighted area in a stadium parking lot and the cabs would come up pick people up and get them out of the area. Hmm. So that was really, a, I thought, a successful venture because it kept cars, for the most part, away from North Street because mm -hmm. they knew they could get a cab right. instead of having all the cabs congregate in different areas such as Ashcroft Lane. Yeah, And I, I remember when Jess came before us for some other concerts, that was one of the questions I asked, if they were going to do that drop-off, the, the taxi drop-off as they, as they had before, which right. you just described, that was successful. And she said, yeah, she said they were doing it, but is that something that we could, um, for the event licenses, like tell them that they, you know, mandate it? That to do that? I mean, it, if it will relieve North Street, it will, if it will make things uh, smoother? Um, Let me talk with uh, Matt Pekarski, their parking engineer, mm -hmm. to see if that is intention. Unfortunately, for the biggest events, such as Patriot Games, uh, that's not available uh, because we don't have. Uh, right, but, but I think most of the problem with North Street is like on um, concerts. The football games, it's, it's an educated audience. Everybody knows where they go, right. blah, blah, blah. It's the concerts where people come once in a lifetime, they're going to come down to see a concert at Gillette Stadium. They don't know what to do. They, they, uh, they get dropped off at North Street, and the taxi driver says, come here, we'll, we'll, we'll pick you up. And then there's a backlog, there's lines at, at North Street of cabs and, and people. And it's like, you know, if it, if it were, if you had a, a better system of bringing them, actually bringing them into the stadium through the, through the that roadway, dropping them off, and then say, "This is where we will pick you up. A cab will pick you up here," and then you can just, you know, seems to me that if it was successful before, it, it should be successful right. all the time. Well, I'll, I'll address yeah. it with them. I don't think there's a requirement for them to do it, uh, and with the amount of construction that's going on on the property, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where they would necessarily reestablish a lot but it's certainly yeah but started. we also have to consider it's consider the neighbors who live on North Street right. who they're the people who live here they're the people who pay the taxes right. there so but on, the, on that same it's a double-edged sword because it relieves the queuing in some areas but if you open it up to taxis you know you build it they will come you'll get vans and taxis and the people on North Street don't want it a throughway for minivan taxis all day long either. So it's an inconvenience on one side, but there's also neighbors that do not want that right. traffic going down Putnam because there's a history of vehicle trips today yeah. and it's all been calculated. So it's not just a quick open it up to taxis because right. that could bring on issues as well. Yeah, but it's worth, it's worth, worth giving a good, yeah. a good trial, right. not just one concert, you know, uh, you know, a good trial, maybe a season to see how it, see how it works out. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next item is a discussion on public records request. Bill? Yes, thank you, that? Madam thank Chair. You. I just, I just will, I'll try to be brief on this because I know that we have, um, this, we're running behind on the schedule tonight, so I want to try and 
get to this uh, quickly. I just want to share with the board some final thoughts and comments about um, about my actions related to the public records request issue, and then and so everyone understands why I was so reluctant to release the draft warrant document. First and foremost, at the outset of the warrant process, uh, there are there are were multiple versions of the draft of the draft warrant, and that's not something that's uncommon. It happens actually quite often. And my concern was not to widely circulate a document that would more than likely change. Uh, until it was ultimately finalized. That concern being not to confuse the public on which, on which document will ultimately be presented for action at town meeting. In summary, my reluctance in, in not releasing the information was born entirely on the premise of releasing accurate information to the public once, uh, until, uh, once it was finalized. There is no basis for asserting that I was purposely withholding information from public disclosure to chill debate. And that's simply not true and, 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 and patently false. On Patriots Day of last week, the assistant town manager and I met with the editor of the Foxborough Reporter, uh, Mr. Bill Stedman and Mr. Mortimer, to try and discuss our collective understanding of how the law is applied in this instance. Following our, uh, my research with the two state agency who administered these laws, I acknowledged that later that, that week that my understanding of the law was flawed. During that same week, um, last Monday, however, we all came to an understanding as to how we will try to address these matters going forward. We agreed that we would be more, meet more regularly on topics of concern to the news media. Um, I have committed uh, toward working on some internal public uh, policies and improvements on this topic. And secondly, we have requested and been granted assistance from the Public Records Division to come out in June and provide some updated training to the public on the public records area. Uh, finally, I've reached out to my professional manager association and advised them of the experience that I have encountered in this area and have offered to address this matter with my colleagues so that they can avoid any similar type of pitfalls. As a final comment, this was a learning experience for me, and I serve to prove, that, and, and this serves to prove that you are never too experienced to be corrected. While some may argue that the impact of this mistake was somewhat limited, I would argue that no mistake should be taken lightly, and we should, take all, we should all take steps to learn from this experience. I, for one, would regret that this error occurred, and, remember that we, and will remember it for a long time to come. And, but again, more from a, I will remember for a long time to come, more from a learning experience as to, you know, that, that the law is, is a complex law in many ways. They were, they were dissecting, they were intersecting laws, the public records law, and it's also the open meeting law. And, and in 2010, the open meeting law actually changed the dynamic a little bit and so caused some level of confusion there. That's why I want to bring the public records focus folks out here so that we can develop practices and policies and procedures so we can handle it properly going forward so we don't run into these kind of issues going forward. Again, everything that was done in this instance was done to provide accurate information to the public without any uh, intent to try and withhold information purposely from anyone. And, uh, and that's, I just wanted to be clear about that. And um, I you know, obviously stand corrected in terms of my understanding of the law in this instance. So I'm happy to take any further comments or thoughts from, from the board, but just wanted to get that on the record so that everybody understood where I came from in this issue. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bill. I think, so you're going to schedule um, training for all employees and board? Uh, yes, open I'm, it up I'm, to actually, and I'm actually opening it up for everyone to come oh, out. The, the problem is that you can only get them out during the day, oh. so um, we won't be able to do that. But we, what we will do is try and get as much information that we can share and maybe do a mini seminar for, mm -hmm. for, for, uh, for other boards later on, showing what kind of information they provided for us. Bill, can you can you tape that that seminar? Yeah, we can do that too. We, do we've it. actually done that with other seminars that we've done. Yeah, recently. Actually, I've be able to post to it as a as a webinar or yeah. something like that. I've talked to the person who's coming out to present and asked her if she'd be willing for us to tape right. it, and she said yes. So. Great. But in fairness to the, to the press and also to, um, and, and uh, we've I've talked at length with with Mr. Mortimer and. And Mr. Stedman, I think we have a good working understanding of how we're going to proceed on this matter going forward. Um, you know, in fairness, I, I just wanted to also acknowledge the fact that, that the information that town council acted on was did not have the piece in it that this, this, this document had been circulated at an open meeting. If he had known that, he said his position on that would have been somewhat different. Um, if it was just an internal document being circulated amongst staff members and, and, um, and, and folks, I think that would have been a little bit different understanding at that point. Do, do you mean because it was mm -hmm. discussed at the advisory committee meeting? Yes. That it made it mm -hmm. When it was discussed in an open session, mm -hmm. and I think it probably you could even argue, even though we didn't actually have the document in front of us for... Um, no, we just had the we, list. We just had the listing in front mm -hmm. of us, so we didn't really refer to the, to the warrant at, the, <coughs> at this meeting. Um, 
I think the the issue there is uh, that it was discussed openly at, at the at the at the, uh, at the advisory at the advisory committee, which which uh, which which changed the dynamic of that situation. Um, you know, I, I worked under that premise for a long time. I've never been questioned on it, so it's, it really was something I never never realized that that was uh, that that was an issue. So. Yeah. Stay corrected. Could I um, just add to that a little bit? And sure. I, I've been Absolutely. going back and forth with Bill probably too much <laughs> on this. <laughs> but we've we've and, been talking a lot about this issue, yeah. so we. We've and and I got to say that the discussions I've had, it, it, his intent was not to yeah. hold back information right. for any other reason, because right. that that's what you did in the past, and that's right. what you thought was right. Right. I've got a concern that kind of elevates over mm -hmm. your position. Sure. So. I look at this, there's two different issues. Mm -hmm. One is the open meeting law. Yep. And the other one is the public records, records law. law. Right. Okay. And there was some interaction. Mm -hmm. What concerns me is we've got a brand new attorney, okay, mm -hmm. that somebody, I'm assuming it was you, mm -hmm. asked his opinion right. on this. And from reading his answer, um, all of a sudden everyone's educated on, um, on um, ex exemption D. Right. Okay. Right. Well, the focus so was exemption. What's D, right? exemption D? Right. All right. The deliberative so, process. So he spent some time talking to you, and then coming up with a written attorney's opinion that's published now. Okay. Right. Right. So if the issue was nobody told him that the warrant article was distributed at the selectmen's table and at the advisory committee, mm -hmm. and and it was discussed publicly, okay. That's the open meeting law. So once a right. document is on a table and it's discussed, it's mm -hmm. a used document, and right. everything is fair game. Right. What my concern is, his finding, if he says he didn't know that, mm. okay, so right. be it, and he would have changed his opinion because now I know that it's, it was different. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a different, different percent. I think he's wrong on this, and this is why. The exemption that he's citing is an exemption for information that's under deliberation that it would harm the public if it got out. Okay, it's policies. Um, mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time with the state on this over the last couple of weeks. The open meeting law agreed that once it's on the table, it's out. Mm -hmm. The open, the uh, public records is telling me that regardless if it's on the open table or not, that warrant article in its infancy, in its draft, all the way till up its final is a public record. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody that's, comes that's in, that's news to me. That's that's yeah, news to me. It's no. if you if you look at the wording on it, and, and basically at the end of our attorney's mm -hmm. findings, he's saying the biggest reason not to give it out mm -hmm. is because it'll confuse the public. Okay, right. so if someone takes it and said, "Here's a warrant article," and and somebody puts it in the paper or distributes it, and right. it's not final. It's going to confuse everybody. I'm sorry, but that's the public process we can put draft on it or whatever you can't hold back a document because of that the statute does have limitations so if there's a warrant article in there say we're going to sell the, the uh, we're going to change the zoning on something and, mm -hmm. and, yep. and we've set a price on a building that we're going to sell mm -hmm. and there's harm to the town because it goes out there and a developer mm -hmm. gets that information too early and it's changing right. that's under deliberation and that mm -hmm. may be exempt okay so that's one article out of 20 articles. Mm -hmm. So if someone asks for the warrant article, then somebody that's versed on the public records would go through it and they'd redact that. They'd take that one item out, they'd mm -hmm. redact it, and they'd say, here you go. Right. Um, I check with the uh, different attorneys, different state, mm -hmm. um, and the state, and they're basically saying the exact same thing. So mm -hmm. if our attorney is telling us that it's exempt because it's going to confuse the public and he's not citing anything in here, I think he's wrong and I think he's got to take a second look at that with all the information. Mm -hmm. so, so in other words, if he's saying it's public only because it's on the table, I still think that's wrong. And I want that resolved, obviously, before the next town meeting. Yeah, yeah, sure, but, absolutely. Um, my question to him is, you know, maybe we have him in here and have him explain it. And if he's wrong, yeah. maybe he's got to take the open meeting law because I, I'm, you know, education is good and, and every time mm -hmm. there's an issue, everyone's gonna take it. But I took it in 2008, I took it in 2010, I took it in mm -hmm. 2012, I get the updates. I'm not taking any more open meeting law mm -hmm. sessions because staff or our attorney's making a decision. So this is a mm -hmm. very important issue to me. Mm -hmm. So if we're gonna talk about it in June, I'd like whoever asked the attorney for their opinion to have them take a second look 
mm -hmm. and I can give him the email and uh, that I got from the state that says perhaps he's wrong and let's resolve this before right. our sessions you, in June. Do you think it would be helpful to have both of you work together with the attorney sure. to go Absolutely. through this because that yeah. way you can do, because I think sometimes it's hard if right. if both parties are not hearing the same question being well, asked. That that's, that's a key point is that it's based, he rendered an opinion based on a certain set of facts which uh, which were absent that piece about uh, certainly the piece about the where it was the, the document had been circulated, so perhaps he's he's looking at something differently as well. So I think it, it would help to be have that have that conversation then. So maybe, maybe to, to to understand where his position was on that because you know several several people that I've talked to are under the impression that the deliberative process is different and is a reason and it's it's different from what you just described. So that that is that is news to me. Okay. So maybe if you could work with Bill and mm -hmm. and, and uh, town council, okay. and then yeah, share we'll that information and together. Yeah, we want to you want to get to the same place. Yeah, mm -hmm. together yeah. talk to the AG's office and then yeah. come back and you know bring town council as you see okay. necessary. Okay. 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 Thank you. And again, okay. I just wanted to, because we've been going back and forth. Yeah. No. It's, it's not. It's this not, is not an adversary. No. It's I just not want to get to the, no, to the right no, information. We want to get we want to get to the right place in this one. So so thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, the next item is uh, discussion, possible vote on omnibus motion to support water and sewer commission actions. I, this is the, uh, the motion that has been prepared by council, uh, special council, uh, special council to the water and sewer commission as well as the town council. And I'll, I'll hand it out to everybody here. So this was um, what I want. It, it's a pretty lengthy um, motion because there's obviously a lot, of, a lot of actions that have occurred between 2013 and now. Um, so um, we have to go back to December 4th when, when the action was actually taken. So we're, we're trying to address that proactively so that we, and, and what this action does effectively is, is, um, is, is confirm the actions taken that the, uh, by the Sewer and Water Commission so that they, we don't leave them, leave their actions hanging out in the wind, if you will. So I think this is really important to have this conversation and, and, to, uh, and to have the board take action on it. So um, the purpose of this, um, is to address many, many, all the normal actions that the board would have taken. And, and, I, and, and any one of the issues that I've looked at, there aren't a lot of actions that specifically have been taken, but uh, I think in terms of s selling capacity, there was only, uh, I think there was only one instance where they've actually sold capacity during, from between July 4th, July 1st, 2014, which was the first opportunity they've had to sell capacity. So they've, they've, I've actually researched that as well. So this is, um, I wanted the board just to take an opportunity to read this. Um, if you're comfortable with it, you can actually act on it tonight. If, if not, you can hold it to your next meeting, but I think it's important to try and get this resolved um, sooner rather than later. Jenny, do you want to read this into the <coughs> record? This is, a, this is the motion that we would be voting on tonight, so read it into the record and then we can have a discussion. Okay. Um, I move that the board vote to ratify and approve acts of the town's board of water and sewer commissioners which were voted, determined, or entered by the commissioners on or after December 4, 2013 to current date, including the following. The setting of water and sewer rates, the acceptance and the conveyance of any interest in real estate relative to water and or sewer operations, any decisions or determinations concerning the disposition of an application for an abatement of rates, fees, or charges, any decision or determination to impose water use restrictions, the approval and denial of any application for a permit for water service, water main installation, a sewer connection, or a sewer extension, the adoption of water and or sewer rules and regulations and amendments thereto, the setting of water and sewer permit fees, penalties, and minimum charges, the declaration of any emergency operations, the execution of an agreement entitled Agreement Establishing the MFN Regional Wastewater District entered with towns of Mansfield and Norton in January 2014 to establish the N M excuse me, MFN Regional Wastewater District in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 101 of the Massachusetts Act of 2010 the appointment of a representative or representatives of the, of the commissioners to serve on the wastewater district commission of the MFN regional wastewater district. <coughs> okay. Can I 
I have a second on that. And then we'll have discussion. A second. Okay. Um, Bill, could you please explain item number two, the acceptance and conveyance of any interest in real estate relative to water and or sewer operations? Yeah, this, this would be if, if in the event that they, if we had to, um, <clears throat> if they had to, to acquire any property um, um, or the, the easements for, but, for but this means they did. So the, the acceptance of if if in fact well that, that, these are the actions that they they have done they, already. they've done already right all right so so this have, might uh, would this have to do or, with the or MFN? may have done right um, what's that would this have to do with the MFN where it wasn't there like a property acquisition in, I think there, uh, I think there Norton? was actually so Jenny? but um, I, I don't have a specific answer on on the, on the actual land that was acquired in this case if that was the case do you I'm remember that Jenny that. no I don't remember no. the specifics yeah the only the only no. When I que I questioned was the um, was it the approval and denial of any application for permit for wastewater service water main installation a sewer connection mm -hmm. or a sewer extension mm -hmm. that that was and that, and was, that was that was the answer that I gave you yeah. already so so but the but the acceptance of the conveyance of any interest I, I was thinking more along the line that if they needed um, the land to um, to build actual sewer lines oh, okay. You follow me? So, you know, to extend lines, so that they would actually uh, acquire easements to to build out, build the lines. But every, so. every everything on this list has already happened. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. right. These and are things that they've so they taken. And action. I'm assuming that everything on this list happened within the borders of Foxborough. Yes. Yes. That that's uh, that. That to me is um, been made clear. I have some information on the that one sale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was um, sewer capacity. The only sewer capacity that has been sold since July 1, 2014 is 60 gallons per day sold to 16 Sherman Street where they added a single bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a letter to Bill from Roger Hill on April 24th entitled Sewer Capacity Sold After July 1, 2014. Right. And that, that was in response to my question. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that refers to bullet number two. Right. Well, no, that referred to uh, the number five number five five okay if there are any other further if something the board's not comfortable with I'm certainly happy to get the information for you but uh, that's entirely right, I, too. I think we have to resolve this because right now everything's just kind of hanging in the yeah. wind yeah. yeah so all right well any other questions on any of the items okay. all those in favor Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Four zero. Thank you. Right, thank you. Okay, the next item is the town manager evaluation. Um, Mary Beth, could you just give a brief description of the process that you just led us through? And sure. Um, so we engaged in a process at the direction of the Board of Selectmen um, at the conclusion of Bill's first year. Uh, we viewed two um, sample evaluation documents. The board selected one that um, was borrowed from another town. Um, and we had Bill fill out a self-evaluation form. He filled that out and circul we circulated that to the board for their comments. Each board member completed an evaluation document on the town manager and sent that directly to me. Um, I compiled those results, and um, we all and we also included Bill's goals and objectives for everybody's information. Um, so we, I compiled those results, came up with a summary of the key points of that evaluation um, that I have for you tonight, and I believe it was a pretty smooth process. I want to thank the board for their. Um, quick and thorough responses. They were very thoughtful and um, very, very helpful. And I believe it was um, a pretty smooth process. Mm -hmm. um, do we have enough? Okay. okay, so this is the summary then this then? This is the summary of um, all I'll the read comments. It to the yep. And, uh, I've bolded for your information the categories that he was rated on, okay. um, summarized in some cases what the consensus was or pulled out some quotes that I thought were especially 
poignant. And then on the second page, you'll see a list of accomplishments that were credited to Mr. Keegan. And then the board has set some objectives for the coming year. Um, I think those were also in conjunction with some of the ones that Bill's, Bill had put on his self-evaluation. Okay. So I'll read this into the record now. So this is the town manager evaluation summary for April 21st, 2014 to April 21st, 2015. The following is a summary of Bill Keegan's performance evaluation for the past year. In the category of leadership and effectiveness, Bill has, quote, clearly and unequivocally established himself in the role of town manager, end quote. He possesses strong leadership skills and has gained the respect of the Board of Selectmen, employees, and citizens. For planning and organizing, Bill exceeded expectations in planning and organizing to include the establishment of a working group to develop a strategy for the replacement of town hall, combined facilities maintenance plan, and the town meeting and warrant process. Bill's professional assessment of the needs of the town and his strategy involves looking at the big picture while reach reaching out to build consensus. In the category of communication and community relations, the board felt that Bill exceeded expectations in this category. He was lauded for his open communication with the Board of Selectmen members, as well as development of positive business and community relations. Quote, he digests and handles issues with constructive aplomb, and always taking the high road. End quote. It must have been John. <laughs> I can't it's a new word, by the way. I've really? not seen that word before. I had to look it up. Okay. So in the category of problem solving, innovation, and decision making, Bill achieved and exceeds this by always reaching out to board members for their input and expertise so he can make an informed decision. He has successfully diffused situations by learning the facts and bringing parties together for a positive outcome. He inherited some problems and has dealt with them effectively. In the category budget and financial management was successfully achieved in his first year. Hmm. I don't see the, um, oh, I see. He basically met the standard. Okay, so yeah. a, a successfully mm -hmm. achieved in the first year and the budget process was completed in a smooth professional manner as a result of Bill's leadership working well with the finance director, school administration, and advisory committee to make the process understandable and transparent, resulting in a balanced, well-thought-out budget for fiscal year 16. With regard to customer service, Bill demonstrates tact and the ability to address difficult situations. Bill is outgoing and approachable with positive outreach to residents. With perfect evaluation marks in the category of personal, professional, and organizational integrity, one member felt that this is his strongest asset. Quote, he is honorable when conducting business and exercises fair and unbiased professional judgment, always advocating for what is best for the town of Foxborough. Another quote, Bill demonstrates high ethical standards and great integrity. Bill exceeded the board's expectations in cross-department organizational management, not only bringing town departments together, but also working well with the school department to collaborate on centralized IT facilities man and facilities management. He demonstrates a team approach to government. For accomplishments, gaining the confidence of the Board of Selectmen, town employees, and citizens through purposeful leadership and communication, bringing the town to consensus on the new town hall, working closely with the school department on IT, budget, and establishing a facilities ma maintenance plan, successfully negotiating contracts, finding a new era of mutual cooperation, an organized approach to the town meeting and warrant process, creating expectations of employee conduct and professionalism, established a new team of assistant town manager slash HR, executive assistant, labor counsel, and special counsel creating a better dialogue with Route 1 businesses, craft organization, and setting the groundwork for economic development consistent with the town's master plan. Developing a fiscally conservative budget process. Great job establishing a new line of communication with the community with broadcasts on cable, meeting with seniors, meeting with Chamber of Commerce and other community partners. For objectives for the coming year, establishment of a business Economic Development Committee to promote economic growth through the town, but especially in the business nodes as noted in the master plan. 
work with town employees on growth and development opportunities to foster a professional workforce seeking continuous improvement. Upgrade websites with information from all boards and committees, especially the posting of meeting minutes. Work with the public building committee, with the permanent building committee on town hall design and finances. Simplify the town's waste hauler arrangement. Implement best practices and continuous improvement programs for all operations. Water and sewer needs capacity versus infrastructure needs and cost. Remain fiscally responsible. Institute processes for monitoring departments' budgets on a monthly basis. Identify steps necessary to attain AAA bond rating. So a summary of overall evaluation comments. Bill's first year as town manager has clearly been successful. While certainly not devoid of challenges and controversies, Bill has, with professional vision and a few pounds of grace, guided the town to a better place than we were a year ago. Bill is a true asset to the community, and that will only grow as he settles into year two. Respectfully submitted by Mayor Beth Bernard, Assistant Town Manager. Thank you very much, Mayor thank Beth. You. Thank you very much, Bill. Good job, Bill. Thank and you. thank you to the board for thank you. making this process work. Um, I think we should have a conversation about salary increase at this time. Mary Beth, could you? Well, before you say that, can I just say a few oh, words? I'm, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Please. Sorry, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to say thank you to all of you. It's it's been, uh, it's really been a pleasure to work with all of you throughout the past year. And even John, of course, who's not here tonight, um, I've told him that personally. That it's been it's been really a tremendous experience for me. Uh, I know this uh, not devoid of controversies, as we know, Frank in the back of the room <laughs> but uh, but we're trying to work through, we, we know we're trying to work through that so he knows he knows that for, for a fact but um, but having said that um, I'm really really pleased with the, with the staff that we've brought on um, my best been a true asset to to me and to, and to the organization um, working with Randy's been tremendous for me personally um, and, and just and just you know, Marsha I mean all the folks that have come on uh, Debbie has been been tremendous as well so um, it's been a very good experience, and I, I just look forward to uh, a number of years going forward and, and continuing to develop this momentum that we're really starting to build now, which I, I really still f I feel very good about, and that the relationships uh, inside and outside the organization, working with the craft group and working with the Businessmen's Association and working with um, the various uh, business partners that we're going to develop over the next several years, so working with Snyder Electric, um, have all been very positive. So. Um, we're not going to we're not going to always agree on things, but we're going to do it professionally and, and with with a lot of um, you know interest in, on behalf of this community. So so thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Anybody want to make any other comments? Great. All right. So in terms of um, having a discussion about a salary increase for Bill, could you just give us you know where we are with the budget basically at this um. point? Having, you know, being new to this process, I was not sure either how this was discussed, but I was assured that this has happened at, you know, in the public meeting that it's been discussed. And um, I checked with Randy on this line item um, for non-union salary increases, and um, we are currently budgeted for a 2% COLA for the town manager's position. And um, it's my understanding that uh, Bill did not uh, he decided to forego a step increase in July 1 of last year. So this year there is a step increase budgeted as well. So that would be a total of 4.5%, um, and that's in keeping with the executive pay plan process. And it's um, in the budget for this year. Okay. Discussion? Uh, for, for no other reason, I, I just wasn't prepared to talk about salary. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to... I guess maybe look at the contract from, from last year and, and think in the big picture and what the other staff members are getting. Mm -hmm. I, I remember a few years ago we went in one direction. Town manager wanted a raise. Nobody else got one, and it was an upheaval. But I do want to look at you independently. Um, and plus we're down one board member. Could this be put off to the next meeting? It, it, whatever we decide is probably retroactive, correct? Uh, so it would be effective July 1. Oh, July 1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's all effective July 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can certainly have the discussion but I just don't think I'm prepared to vote on a salary 
adjustment tonight. And maybe that was my shortcoming. I just didn't expect it. And I'm sorry if yeah. you guys did. I didn't realize this. I think, um, again, given that the board may change in a, in a week, my thought was that we would, you know, have this done before that happened and, you know, complete the process. So I don't know. Maybe we can try to talk through it, see what you think. But okay. Even though John's, John's not here. Either. John actually submitted a suggestion for a salary. Oh, he did? Okay. Um, yeah. It, there was a line on the evaluation that if people chose to And he took advantage of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, what did he suggest? He suggested um, 3.5. Okay. But we, hadn't, we didn't have a discussion about the budget at that okay. point. Uh, he's been away in San Francisco. Okay. So 3.5 with the COLA? So there's a COLA, there's a step, so he's yeah, saying he 3.5 um, altogether? There's no, there wasn't the opportunity to request a step. It was just um, a, a COLA increase. So it he suggested, one line. oh, one, so yeah. whatever it's a, because he wouldn't be able to say what the cost of living is that's set. No, right. Mm -hmm. So he's and saying whatever whatever the A and B is together, it's the three and a half? That, I believe so, but I absolutely didn't have a chance mm -hmm. to talk to him about it since he sent it in. I received it on Sunday and he left on, he left for San Francisco. Gotcha. Oh, okay. okay. Um, All right. Um, Right now, what's budgeted is combined a six and a half percent. No, four and a half. Four and a half. Four and a half. Four and a half. That's combined. Four. That's combined. Right. Okay. That's in line with what the uh, other That's employees in both the unions and mm -hmm. also the right. So um, for the current fiscal year, um, there was a two percent salary increase and a step. Mm -hmm. um, Bill didn't get the step this year. Mm -hmm. but yeah, the, the union, the union piece is still being negotiated, yeah. so gotcha. we have. So we're just looking at the non-management, uh, okay. the non-managerial, and the, you know, the way the right now the part-time seasonal people, everyone's budgeted for the all the salary schedules go up by two percent, and then they get a step. Okay. So everything else was in. You want me to leave the room for this discussion? <laughs> <No. laughs> no. no. It's like I'm having an out of body experience here. <laughs> <laughs> well. But. I think if it's budgeted mm -hmm. and it's in line with what's been um, consistent mm -hmm. uh, to the rest of the employees, I, I have no problem with it. But as long as long as we're maintaining consistency. Right. I, and I confirmed before this meeting with Randy that that was in fact the number. Jenny, do you have any comments? Um, I agree with I. I didn't expect us to be voting on this tonight, but I, I understand your, your concern about this being the, the last, you know, meeting for this iteration of the board. Um, and John did give give his input, but I, I agree with Dave. If it's um, if it's already in the budget and it's consistent with what other people, um, I, I would agree. And and I I really do believe that you have done a, a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, Coming into this town, we were, we were, <laughs> it was dysfunctional at best. And I think you've really, um, really proved that you have lived up to your resume. And uh, Thank so you. Appreciate that. I, w I would have no problem voting tonight for it. I'd like to voluntarily offer some thoughts here. Um, I, where I saw, where I saw John made it, uh, you know, you're talking about four and a half, and they're talking, and John mentioned three and a half. I'd be willing to settle at four in between, and just to voluntarily do that. That's going to take some of the pressure off the issue. Uh, even though I know that's been two and a half has been what's been given to other non-union employees, um, and uh, two percent is uh, cola. I mean, I I'm perfectly happy with that. I'm not. I'm, I wouldn't object to that. I wouldn't. Want to go? I don't want to talk about the other side of that, but it's. I'm trying to be fair about it too. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, I. To be honest with you, I have a problem with that because if you earn it and you're worth it, you should be taking what. We, you know, why take less than everybody else just to make it convenient for us? <coughs> I, I appreciate what you're doing, but I. I think that gets us out of a bind, but it's not being fair to you, to be honest with you. Um, 
I appreciate that. Yeah, the, the other. Yeah, I, I, I stand by what I said. Yeah, yeah and I, I stand I, by I, what he said. What did you say again? I'm sorry. I don't remember. <laughs> he said four and a half percent. Four, four and a half percent. I mean, it's, it's in the budget. It's in line with yeah. everybody else. I think else this is an exceeds consistent. expectations performance, so I would support four and a half percent. You know, it's, it's odd. It, it, and, and this is obviously the public process. I, the laundry's out here, and it is what it is in the public. But, you know, years ago, we went to the step, not the step, the merit. Mm. to reward people that were innovative and, and went above and beyond. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, mixing the private process with the public, it didn't go very well. So now we're back to the steps. And to base somebody's, you know, the Kohler is given, but merit based on what everyone else is getting, you know, right or wrong, it's tough for me to do that because, you know, let's, so you know why why have why do this job performance if you're going to get what everybody else is so you should be getting more if you did more or in fairness you should be getting less if this was low so you know just because it's budgeted and, and I'm not being argumentative but just because the money's there and what's everyone else is getting he should be getting the same thing that it just drives me nuts to do that and and I think you know if you think it, of it's it. the the private public difference yeah. that I'm having trouble with I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I think if, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it as it's, it's that number in total. If you are in the private sector, that's a really great raise. Yeah, I'm, it's a four know, and a half is it's an incredibly I'm great not, I'm not increase. It so I'm not looking at it as a COLA plus. It's, it's like this is a professional valuation, and this is uh, definitely warrants and exceeds uh, an above average increase. So. And I, you know, I view the four and a half as an above average. So, <clears throat> can I get a motion? I move. I move to. What's that word? To uh, to award a an annual increase, of four, four and, and a half, half percent. percent. I move to award uh, William Keegan, the town manager of Foxborough, an annual increase of uh, four and a half percent. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I want to really, truly thank you for. Well, thank uh, you. It's it's been my this pleasure. This past year, my it's pleasure. been very good. Thank you. Okay. Um, All right, uh, next item is Bill's town manager update. Thank you. Um, a couple of things that I just wanted to um, bring to your attention is that the, there was a we um, had a request for um, to, to consider a, um, a way in which we could actually recognize the entrepreneurial spirit of this community, and, and um, I had some thoughts about this um, uh, recently. I said, you know. Not a lot has been discussed about the entrepreneurial spirit of, of young, especially young people trying to develop their own businesses. And, um, and my thoughts are that we should, we should try and recognize that as a community. And I, and I, I therefore developed a, um, a proclamation, which I, I like to present, have the board read into the record if you're, if you're so willing to do, to designate the month of May as, as the as celebration of entrepreneurial spirit month. And, um, and actually then ask and, and reach out for anyone, any young person or older person in this community who is actually developing a business, a new entrepreneurial business that actually leads and helps a local economy. Especially with those businesses that actually develop by young, like the youth in this community, the, the workforce, the young workforce. Um, but at the same time, acknowledging that um, all entrepreneurial spirit is something that we should all celebrate on a regular basis. So um, I, I propose that to the board, and then that if, if there are individuals in the community that, that want to start their own businesses or have been starting their own businesses, uh, I'd be happy to send them a letter uh, if, 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 the, if the board acknowledges, wants to acknowledge individuals. Um, I'd be happy to send them a letter personally, congratulating them and um, sending them a letter to say congratulations on behalf of this community. So. so this is the proclamation from the town of Foxborough. 
whereas the town of Foxborough has an interest in celebrating the entrepreneurship of its citizens, and whereas entrepreneurs provide opportunities for students and future entrepreneurs by fostering personal and professional growth, and whereas the town of Foxborough acknowledges that the entrepreneurship of residents is important to the long-term growth of this community, and whereas the town of Foxborough acknowledges admiration of entrepreneurship on an annual basis, and whereas the town of Foxborough congratulates entrepreneurs on maintaining and managing their own businesses and wishes them continued success, now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Selectmen that the month of May be designated as Entrepreneurial Spirit Month in the town of Foxborough, in witness whereof we have set our hand and caused the seal of the town of Foxborough to be affixed on this 28th day of April 2015. Very nice. Great. So, any entrepreneur? Any, any entrepreneur who is in, in the community, uh, who is, uh, you don't have to actually have your business here necessarily, but if you reside here or if you're from here, um, we'd be happy to learn who those people are and we'll present their names at the, at the next selectmen's meeting, uh, next two selectmen's meetings, which are during the month of May. And then uh, if there are individuals that we'd like to recognize or acknowledge, then I will personally send them a letter uh, thanking and congratulating them on behalf of this community. Thank you. Okay. Could I um, could I offer a name? Sure. Um, in, in kind of the I mean it, it's I think that's a wonderful thing. I think we'll get a little bit this year. I think next year when people know this is here, they'll yep. um, they'll strive for this. The person I have in mind, uh, Kevin Martinetti. He was a senior last year. He was an honor student. Um, I actually coached him on my. Uh, basketball team. He went to UMass. He's at the uh, business school. And he's already come back to Foxborough and hired, I think, um, eight Foxborough uh, kids Great. for the summer. He's uh, got a painting job. And he's looking uh, between the Foxborough high school kids graduating and the mm -hmm. graduating senior class from last year. He's talking about 15 kids hiring this summer. And he's spending already 40 hours. So Great. if the vehicle is for have the town manager to write a letter referencing the entrepreneurship. If, if I could nominate him um, to kind of be the catalyst for this, that would be great. Well, we have our first one. Great. Okay. <laughs> very good. All right. Very good. Thank All right. You. Okay. So. Thank you. So you, need, I think you need a motion to accept the the, the proclamation and then uh, okay. the approval. So I move that we accept the. Proclamation for Entrepreneurial Spirit Month for May for the Town of Foxborough. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Then, then the um, with respect to, um, I actually received. A, I'm very honored to receive a, a, an invitation by the by the by the Hockamock YMCA to serve as a member of the of uh, the Board of Incorporators, which I just received this past week. So. Very pleased to accept that that nomination and uh, have so notified them as well uh, to serve in that capacity. So thank you. Um, one thing that I, I do need to work on this this current fiscal current uh, current year actually calendar year is that um, I've been a credentialed manager in ICMA for the past five years, and um, every five years I'm required to to do a multi rater assessment. Um, for, through uh, through a tool that they that they provide me to uh, to evaluate my strengths and weaknesses in, in multiple multiple categories. So this is what you provided to me was was a, an assessment of what I've done this past year. But this is sort of a a, build, a, a a learning tool for me so that I can continue to develop my skill set so I can maintain my credential status in in ICMA. Uh, for those who don't know what the credential status means is that I've committed myself to a lifelong learning curve of uh, professional development, uh, constant learning that, um, that, are, that, are, that uh, of all, all the city managers and town managers throughout the world, there are only 1,300 are actually in that status. So it's a very distinguished status to have and it's something that I've, I've really been very proud of and, and very stri and strive to continue on with. So I, I, I'm going to need the assistance of the board and members of the community at large to work on this with me so that I can actually um, you know, continue to develop that learning, that learning tool. It's something that um, 
I've never gone through before. So it's, I'm, I'm going to need you know some some help with this a little bit. Then I've asked, I've reached out to other managers in the in the state to who aren't credentialed who've gone through it, and, I, and they've given me some guidance on it. So I'm working on this on this piece right now. So I just wanted to let everyone know that I'll be reaching out to various folks throughout the the community to 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 provide some get some and gain some input from things that uh, they know about me and how they how we can continue to develop my my uh, my my um, work expectations, if you will. And then um, the um, I did receive a notice this past week from Columbia Gas that they are going to be going up rather significantly over the next year. They they filed a um, an, an increase um, with um, with the, with the, the Department of Public Utilities, which um, which I'll be happy to share with the press, by the way, because I think it's important that they get this word out that um, it's a rather significant increase that um, because of the fact that their their actual lines and their um, and the capacity is not adequate to meet the needs of the of the growing uh, growing demand here in um, in Massachusetts and the New England region for that matter. I actually attended a, a seminar actually at Gillette Stadium this past week also on the same topic and it's it's quite intriguing to me to see that other parts of the country have we have plenty of gas supply that's not the issue the problem is we don't have the capacity to deliver that supply and so what's happening now is that there is uh, a growing concern and growing cost of developing that capacity throughout the entire northeast region so folks in this part of the country are going to be seeing some rather significant jumps in their utility bills when it comes to gas supply um, primarily because what they're trying to build, build the infrastructure so um, I just want everybody to be aware of this it's something that we will see probably in the course uh, by, by if it gets approved it will be effective next March of 2016 so you will start seeing some increases in those bills as a result of that so I want everybody to be aware of that I'm going to share the, the, the um, I'll share of course with the board but I'll also share with with, uh, with Frank uh, for the newspaper's uh, edification as well. Yeah, Bill, is this due to that pipeline that they want to build and it, it's being challenged? No, not the pipeline itself. Because I think the pipeline, the, the Trans Canada pi pipeline, are you referring to that one? Is that where the? That's one that goes through <coughs> Rhode Island, and then they plant it yes, up New Hampshire. Yes, it, it is. It is that one. That's the one. Because That's if we, if we're in bad shape, Maine is really is in really bad shape. shape yeah. And it is that. It's all, it all plays into it. It all yeah. plays into it. There just isn't enough. There's, a, there's only so much gas you can put through that line, right. and we just don't have a, we, we, the inf infrastructure here in Massachusetts and New England region is older. Uh, it, we, we've never been a big demand, a big, a big demand for gas supply uh, over the years, so therefore the infrastructure was never built. And then on top of that, we most of the regions in the, throughout New England particularly in the, in the urbanized areas, are, are really well developed. So in trying to build a infrastructure through that developed area, you end up with a lot of conflicts along the way. So it's not an easy thing to, to fix. And so we're going to see a lot of discussion about this in, in the coming months. But uh, just so you know, this is on the horizon. We've got to deal with it. Uh, I want the, the, the public to be aware of it as well, that this is something that's coming. And then last but not least, oh, actually two things. Uh, I want to welcome Lorraine Newell, who is our new financial analyst. We'll actually bring Lorraine in probably the next meeting to, mm -hmm. to introduce her to everybody. She started yesterday. She's, uh, she's working with uh, the new the finance department and a very really highly talented uh, uh, addition to our staff um, who's working at MIT for the past, uh, past 10 years. So a very, very smart, very bright gal who is, uh, lives in the region, you know, lives in this area, and uh, wanted to get closer to home. So. So we're happy. Well, uh, the MIT's losses loss is our gain, so I'm very happy to have her here. And last but not least, we did uh, tape another show, uh, uh, um, cable show today. Uh, it's focused entirely on the warrant uh, for Tom meeting. We went through every article uh, in, in reasonable detail mm -hmm. uh, at the meeting. I had uh, Mary Beth and, and Randy on the show. We went through the budget process, uh, tried to ed educate folks as much as we could within that 40 minute time frame, which is pretty hard to do. Um, but we did it, and I think it, it should come out pretty well. Um, they didn't think they had to edit much out of it, so um, hopefully it'll be, it'll be helpful and educational to everyone attending town meeting on May 11th. Just to remind to everyone that May 11th is town meeting day. It's seven, starting at 7.30 at, at, uh, at Foxborough High School. And so um, any registered voter, because this is an open, for, open meeting, open town meeting format, a registered voter can attend. 
Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so now we have action items. Okay. Um, the first one is in regard to a license renewal for um, a Robert C. Loring. All the paperwork is in order. So I move that the Board of Selectmen vote to approve the renewal of a Hackney license for Robert C. Loring expiring on April 28, 2017. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Next is the regard to a gift donation to the Council on Aging yeah, Human Services. I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the acceptance of donations from various people totaling $915 in memory of Mrs. Irene Shea. Uh, second that donation with gratitude. All those in favor? Okay. Aye. Um, the next is a, uh, in regard to a recreation department, a gift donation. I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the acceptance of a donation of $100 from the Foxborough Animal Hospital to the Recreation Department and thank the hospital for its generosity. You know, I'll second that with gratitude, the $100. All those in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. Aye. The next is in regard to Rodman Ford Sales. They're requesting a one-day beer and wine license. Um, this was held over from last meeting for, uh, in, so we could get more information on the event. And so um, the, I'll read what the event is. Robin Floyd would like to host a fundraiser on May 2nd, 2015 for the Scorpion Boston Breakers Youth Soccer Club. The club is a nonprofit youth soccer club based out of Braintree, Massachusetts. The funds raised from the event will be scholarships granted to children that are at financial need. The club's mission is to develop plays for the highest level of play and to become known across the U.S. as an elite level club. So I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the one day beer and wine license for fund fundraiser for the Scorpion Boston Breakers Youth Soccer Club on May 2nd, 2015 at Rodman Ford. A second. All those in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. Uh, the next is in regard to the Clean Up Foxborough Committee, it's gift donations. Um, I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the acceptance of various donations totaling $2,500 to the Clean Up Foxborough Committee and thank the donors and the committee on behalf of the town of Foxborough. I'll second that, but just a quick, um, because this is a big community event, I just, could I just read some of these real quick just so people know the depth of what we're accepting? So Foxborough Fish and Game, they gave $300 to t-shirts. Uh, United States Services provided the porta parties Different rentals, the tables, chairs, and tents. Dunkin' Donuts, the coffee for the volunteers. Fertilon, uh, mulching uh, over at different areas, the Borough School, the Ahern School um, areas. Uh, Mordini Brothers is providing the mulch for different landmark uh, around, beautification around town. Supreme Industrial Products, uh, the trash bags and gloves. I think that's Larry Stern that does that, right? Mm -hmm. um, Jake and Joe's of Foxborough is giving all the food, hamburgers, hot dogs, and buns. Foxborough Fire Department's providing their large grill. New England Patriots are offering two tickets to the uh, to a Patriots game, uh, preferred parking, and a one-day uh, field pass. Foxborough never forgets uh, the money towards the cost of the T-shirts they're donating. Foxborough Stop and Shop, the beverages and water. Schneider Electric is using their um, facility over uh, the Schneider Grove to host the event. And Dooley Disposal um, is providing all the labor, um, picking up all the trash, the trucks to haul it, and then the disposal fees. So huge, huge community event. If people have the time to go out on Saturday, it would be great. Um, Jack Bacalette called today. He just wanted everybody to know that uh, Foxborough never forgets gave a $500 donation to the um, T-shirts. The T-shirts, great. Yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great news, by the way. That's a, that's a great event. It's a big undertaking, I, I'm, sure. I'm, at this point, I won't be here to, to help out, but um, next year, for sure. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, the next are uh, three reappointments to, put to the Clean Up Foxborough Committee, and I'll just include them in one motion. I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the reappointment of Jack Offlett, Christina Belanger, and Arthur Dooley to the Clean Up Fox Road Committee for terms expiring May 1st, 2016, and thank them for their willingness to serve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, the next is in regard to um, a taxi license renewal. 
Uh, I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the renewal of the taxi cab license for, this, uh, for Tony Saliba expiring December 31st, 2015. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And the final one is for the Foxborough Planning Board Community Forestry Grant Application. Um, I just want to read the summary of it. The project summary, Foxborough experienced major long-term power outages in September 2011 after Hurricane Irene. In October 2012 after Hurricane Sandy that prompted an aggressive tree removal program by both National Grid and the town. Hundreds of disease, damage, and problem trees have been removed <coughs> along public ways in the town. Since the trees have been removed, the town hasn't experienced a powder, uh, power outage due to trees taking out power lines. We propose to purchase $5,000 worth estimated 18 to 25 trees, large enough and of suitable species for street trees. Under the supervision of the tree warden, we will plant tree trees along designated streets in suitable locations in proximity to residents' homes who have volunteered to adopt and water the new tree. We had a similar program on Payson Road, which was rebuilt in 2011-2012 using the Peewood funds, and it was very successful. So what we, the Board of Selectmen have to do is we have to vote to allow Sharon Wasson of the Planning Board to submit the grant application for, um, by permitting the chairman to sign the application. So I move that the Board of Selectmen vote to allow the Board of Selectmen chairman to sign the application for a community forestry grant and thank Sharon Wasson for um, doing all the paperwork for this tree grant. Once again, she has done a really mm -hmm. good job in um, writing grants for us. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. That's it. All right. Motion to return. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Have a good night. <laughs>